So hello everyone, uh, my name is Luis Ferrero, one of the hosts of the Dairy Nutrition Black Belt podcast. And today we will continue with our interview with Rod Martin, uh, Dairy Nutritionist with Protecta. Uh, and during our last episode, uh, Rod told us a very nice story about how the nutrition approach to mitigate hypocalcemia in dairy herds evolved. And the last part of that discussion was about phosphorus, which was one of the macro minerals that we perhaps didn't pay a lot of attention when trying to mitigate hypocalcemia. So Rod, please tell us a little bit more about that. And you know, for, for the young nutritionists out there, how do you formulate diets based on this concept to help mitigate hypocalcemia? Yeah, yeah. as I mentioned before, the uh, the phosphorus has probably been, well, not probably, has been overlooked in, in formulating diets, uh, especially when we start looking at negative DCAD diets or, or just low potassium diets in general. And, and formulating for lower dietary phosphorus gets to be challenging because, um, uh, as I mentioned before, the data is really pretty clear on uh, lower dietary phosphorus in dry cows and prefresh cows has a positive effect on blood calcium levels. And there's a good science-based mechanism for that. But when it comes to practically balancing diets for uh, uh, the lower dietary phosphorus, it gets to be a challenge. And one of the main reasons for the challenge is that as farms have modernized and gotten bigger through the last 20 years, is that uh, we feed a lot of byproducts. Byproducts are high in phosphorus. Uh, and phosphorus is, you know, and lower is better. Um, but when we're feeding a lot of byproducts, uh, and since we didn't have much focus on phosphorus in dry cow diets, people didn't pay any attention to it. So bottom line is for nutritionists out there, it was not unusual to see 0.4 to 0.45% phosphorus in prefresh diets. Uh, I definitely balanced them that way too. I didn't pay much attention to it. You kind of let it float because you're trying to get the least cost diet, the cheapest protein sources uh, in there, but the phosphorus crept up on us. Until we started thinking about and looking at the recent research on lower dietary phosphorus, um, it's not a good idea to have dietary phosphorus in prefresh cows over 0.4%. There's multiple studies out there showing that the higher the dietary phosphorus, uh, the lower the blood calcium. So what we like to do is get that uh, uh, dietary phosphorus down to whether you're using a negative DCAD diet program or whether you're using um, a one group dry cow program or whether you're looking at using a binding product uh, for binding, binding phosphorus, it's still good to get that phosphorus level down to 0.3% if possible. Closer to 0.3% would be would be best. Uh, that means things like distillers and canola meal and corn gluten feed have to be used uh, within good judgment um, or certain levels because they can be big contributors uh, to that. Canola meal is, is certainly one of the bigger uh, contributors to uh, dietary phosphorus. So I guess my, my final analysis of this is don't overlook phosphorus in the dry cow diet, prefresh diet, and lower is better, and try to find feed stuffs that can, can meet the meet those needs. All great advice, and I'm sure that uh, people at home will start utilizing some of those to improve their diets and make sure that cows are, let's say, safe from hypocalcemia. But Rod, in addition to nutrition concepts affecting uh, cows, tell us more about how about the nutritional management or management in general, as well as the environment, how those yeah. play a role uh, with hypocalcemia and what can we do to mitigate some of those issues? Yeah, it's, uh, and you know, one thing, you know, when I kind of first started in, the, in this business many years ago, you know, we felt we could solve all the problems with just with a good ration, good nutrition. Nutrition solves everything, right? But as we've learned as facilities have modernized and changed and herds have gotten larger is that the environment and the management of that environment, uh, along with nutrition, it's, uh, it's a three part uh, uh, stool, it's a three legged stool, so to speak, that all those three areas need to be uh, looked at. Uh, so from a, from a management standpoint, um, 
you know, having, having cows uh, with good cow comfort and uh, overcrowding is a big one that can, can cause lots of issues. So I kind of look at things like, uh, like you're playing cards, you know, and there's, when you have cards, you have something called a trump card. A trump card overrides everything and uh, that takes the trick. So basically you can have a really good nutrition program, but if the cows are really overcrowded and we got some buck management issues or whatever, uh, that will trump the nutrition program every time. So there's really five really good fundamentals of uh, management and environment uh, in, in when we look at prefresh uh, management. You know, certainly you want to have a, I'm a big believer of the high fiber prefresh diets, but you got to make sure the moisture and the particle size is good so there's no sorting. Uh, you also got to have um, uh, good cow comfort, um, plenty of bunk space. You need to have a fresh cow protocol in place. And you got to have those things kind of kind of covered because the nutrition program will not work if those things are not in place. Now, another area that I've been working the last four years is I've been doing a lot of TMR quality control checks out on prefresh diets. And, and that's a challenge on a lot of farms getting that TMR mix correctly. Typical fresh cow incidence of clinical hypocalcemia is three to 6%, while subclinical hypocalcemia affects 50% or more mature cows. Based on cutting edge research, Exelite offers a new approach that is build effective and the ZDUs. For more information, visit www.protecta.com. No, absolutely. Certainly nutritional management, you know, plays a major role uh, in their nutrition and, and, and could mask a lot of the good results that we could see with some strategies. So you mentioned, you know, uh, the difficulties sometimes of getting a good mixing uh, for those smaller batches. Are there any uh, strategies that you saw out there that could be implemented uh, to help with this issue? Or is there anything specific that you think people should be trying or emphasizing uh, for yeah. those diets? Every mixer is different. Uh, the vertical mixers can be more, maybe a little bit more of a challenge, but pre-processing that straw or that hay first, instead of trying to have the mixer do it, some mixers can maybe do it, but uh, you really, you really got to find a way to get that particle size to the point where the cow does not sort it out. Moisture helps. Obviously, the particle size helps. Uh, the sequencing of how you mix the feed in the TMR helps. But, you know, it is still, a, it's, it's a little bit, there's science to it, but there's quite a bit of art to, of making sure that you got the right person doing the mixing so we get a consistent TMR every every time. But I would, I would say that I, I just, when I go out to farms, I want to see that particle size and moisture really dialed in. Oh, absolutely. All oh, great advice. Uh, thanks again, Rod, uh, for sharing all those, uh, well, different topics that can help us do a better job with transition cows and mitigating uh, hypocalcemia. We really appreciate your insights and time today. Uh, thank you all for listening to our podcast. We will see you soon. Yeah, thank you.